warm outside, so I'm going to try to keep this talk relevant, but also a little light. Um, one other thing to know about me is that when I get a theme, I get a little crazy about it. So there was one time where I did a Game of Thrones talk, and there were lots of gifts, and it was, it was a little overboard. So I tried to back it off a little bit, but this does have a theme, uh, uh, and it relates to music. So if you don't know music, I'll do my best to keep you coming along with me throughout this talk, okay? Uh, but first, let's set the mood, right? Get it? Okay. So um, I think we've heard a lot of talk so far already uh, about the need to have a shared language, right, for which we can use to anchor our analyses, our collaborations, all this data integration. It's so, uh, so necessary in today's world. Um, in, even earlier today, I heard reference to the BD2K, so Big Data to Knowledge. Uh, group. So BD2K has a really cool um, YouTube channel right now called the Fundamentals of Data Science and they are in essence putting a class, a data science like 101 class out on YouTube, a new uh, video each week. And Dr. Mark Musen from Stanford uh, gave the first talk uh, to introduce the topic and he, uh, he really tried to say that the tide is turning and it used to be that your output of your research was a publication and that was it. And that's no longer the case anymore, right? Now the output is your data, and what have you done with your data, and what else can other people do with it? And earlier today, too, we heard talk reference to data parasites, right? That's, uh, and uh, you know, we just talked about it in this session. Um, data parasites are, are real, and it's a good thing uh, to have people that want to continue looking at our data and finding new insights uh, quicker without having to rerun the experiment. So it's really important that we have something to help anchor all of these things. You to, in order to share and reuse this data, it's got to mean a common language, okay? So, uh, necessary. Okay, so there also, just in case you guys have, uh, get these slides at all, I'll give you a link to the, that channel. All right, but uh, so what, what, what am I pitching here? I'm pitching an ontology, but that's kind of a loaded word, right? A lot of people have different ideas about what it means to be an ontology, what an ontology is, what an ontology needs to have. Um, I'm kind of boiling it down to, to three main things. Terms are defined. The relationship between the terms is defined. And those terms are arranged into a hierarchy, okay? Cool, that sounds easy, right? <laughs> What's the problem? Why is this so hard? Well, uh, some of you guys got a preview of this. Uh, at this point, I'd like to just remind everyone why it's so hard. Can we get there? This man right here is my great-grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half-wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, yeah. Oh, I'm you sorry, hear the guys. stories. It's, I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. EDS, managing the complexities of the digital economy. Okay, EDS. Now, how do I get out of here? What are we going to see next? This is embarrassing. My YouTube uh, prep. Get out of here, quick. Okay, magic AV guy in the clouds. How do I get back? Uh, I got you. Okay. He's on it. He's on it. Okay. So, all right. So, what's so hard? The problem is ontology, doing an ontology, it's not a technical problem. It is literally herding cats. It's a person problem, okay? When I was talking to some of my colleagues about this, trying to figure out what am I going to tell you all, um, uh, one of them was a software developer. And he said, you know, Becky, my job as a software developer is to take computers and get them all to work the same and get them to think like people. But developing an ontology is the opposite. It's getting people to think the same and work like computers. And that is really hard, and it's not a technical problem. It's a social problem, right? It's a communication problem. Getting people to agree on the same words and what the word means is really difficult. Uh, and, but I think we've heard all throughout this talk that it's also, sorry, this talk, this presentation, this whole conference is that it's vital, okay? So what I'm gonna try to explain to you here is how we have done this on my team. Um, 
And, uh, but first, also just to give you an idea of who I am and what I do now. So right now I work at the University of Michigan and I work in a cutting edge nephrology lab. So I know cutting edge and kidney disease doesn't probably go together in your vocabulary normally, but we really are kind of cool. And um, we are a part of the Applied Systems Biology Corps. And what we're trying to do now is um, act as a bridge, as it says there, that middle bullet that's highlighted, uh, to connect deep biological and clinical knowledge of domain experts with relevant segments of genome-wide data sets. So we have bench to bedside, we have a lot of clinician scientists, but we're also using a lot of genomic data. And Transmart is one of the ways we do that, that we act as a bridge. Um, right now, we use Transmart as a way to facilitate data sharing in a couple collaborations that we're involved in. And one of those I'll talk about here. Um, and uh, just to give you an idea of who our users are, our users are mainly clinicians. And the thing they like about Transmart is that they can easily drag and drop and get some answers to their questions. A lot of times their question is, are there enough samples in this consortium that have this particular profile so that I can go run a new analysis with the, with the samples. Um, so it's maybe a little different user group than some of you have, and they have a little different needs, and that is important to remember for later. So um, uh, again, going to the musical theme, let me tell you a little bit about the composers here. So uh, that's my face. It's it's a lot bigger screen than I was expecting. Um, but there's also there in the middle, Rachel Dull, who's here at this conference, and uh, Colleen Kincaid. So the three of us, between the two of us, or the three of us, we have made two different ontologies now. Um, the first one we made, we started back in 2008, and that was for a, a tool called Oncomine that you may have heard of. Oncomine is a gene expression um, tool. Okay, lot, some heads are nodding, so some of you have seen that. And when Oncomine first started, it was a place where uh, we took geo data sets, dumped them into uh, one place, and then people could try to do some analyses on this data and hopefully sometimes do the same analysis on multiple data sets. And we were really trying to enable those data parasites. That was that was eight years ago, though, really 10 years ago when Oncomine first started. Um, but then we realized that it didn't... Um, it wasn't really doing the job completely enough because the data was still just disparate geo data sets that we dumped into one place. So, hey, that was already done in geo. Why did we just do that again? So we realized that what we needed to do and the real power behind Oncomine was if we could organize that data onto a common vocabulary. And doing that would enable uh, these meta-analyses on all sorts of different data sets on one plane. And uh, in, in addition, we also extended Oncomine and made something called Nephromine, which is now called Nephroseq, and that's one of the things I work with now uh, at the university, as well as these four different Transmart instances that we manage that all have a different renal uh, ontology. So in Oncomine, just to give you a quick screenshot, this is kind of the high-level view of uh, some of the things we organized back eight years ago and what made sense at the time for cancer. And doing that ontology allowed us to create, as I said, these automated analyses. So this visualization is showing you that because, for instance, we cleaned up triple negative breast cancer, which was data that was all over the map. Um, it's, it was there, it was there in almost every breast cancer data set for genomic data, but it was never the same column, never the same terms. Just even cleaning that up meant that we could now go click on all those same analyses. Actually, it meant that we could run these analyses automatically, and we just had something running in the background that would create a new differential expression analysis if we had the data in the right format to do it. And so on the very right, what you see is all those different data sets. I have checked seven different data sets, and the, the, the differential expression analysis of each of those triple negative analyses sorted by gene rank and that median rank means that top gene there, what's that, GSTP1? That was uh, at median, it was the fifth highest ranked gene in all of those different defects analyses. And we couldn't do that before, but that's what our dream was with Oncomine. And so once we added the ontology, that could happen. And that's still, I just pulled this yesterday. So Oncomine's still around, um, even though we, we left it <laughs> for the university. Um, another one here is just a look at the Neptune uh, Transmart instance. So this is one of the renal disease places. Uh, yeah, the highlighting work just to kind of show you a couple of the main, I thought people might want to see the main groups that we found. So I'll explain, you know, we, we're, we've been seeing a lot of different pictures of different people's groups and why they came up with what they did. And so kind of next I'm going to tell you a little bit about our formula for how we decide what to, what to make in our ontologies. So we've done two very different ones now, and uh, you know, who knows what, 
where my next job will take me and what disease area, but I think that the formula that we're, we've been applying is extensible enough, maybe it's simple enough that we can apply it to lots of disease areas. So how do you pen the music? Okay, again, I like music metaphors. So um, if you notice at the beginning, I said uh, the paradox, right, of standardized ontology, fugue and variations. So in music, a lot of music sounds very different, but underneath it, a lot of them are the same formula. So this is a screen capture of a, a YouTube video explaining the fugue if you wanted to watch it. But what they were talking about is that lots of music starts with preset structures and methods that are then organized. And in a fugue, what happens is you hear one melody that gets introduced, and then uh, a new voice plays that same melody later, while the original voice keeps going with a slightly different thing. And I think it's uh, kind of relevant to what happens when we're trying to organize data. We need to kind of have some organizing ideas, but we also need the ability to have a little counterpoint. And without the flexibility of both of those things, uh, a lot of times we end up um, stymied. Uh, I'll, I think I'll say this later, but uh, the phrase perfect is the enemy of good, you may have heard. Sometimes perfect is the enemy of done. Um, and that happens a lot when you're trying to make an ontology. So. Uh, just encourage you to have the flexibility to have a structure, uh, but also the, the ability to have some counterpoint. Um, all that aside, uh, I, I'm a simple person, and I want a simple solution, but there is no silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. I know we're trying to get out of here some standards we can put on the website, maybe make an SOP. I'm going to give you what I can give you, but it's, we all know it's hard, and it's not simple, and it's it depends, uh, and that's just as much the case here as in anything else. So um, at the same time, I've, as I said earlier, I'm going to keep it light, keep it simple. Um, and uh, there was a, a writer named Arthur Kostler who once said, the more original the discovery, the more obvious it seems afterwards. So hopefully I'm going to show you some kind of obvious things. But at the time, they were not very obvious to us, and they were kind of eureka moments. And now as I typed them out, I thought, well, gosh, this is kind of plain. But hopefully it'll help you anyway. Okay, so what's our formula? Step one, just kind of look around, look for patterns. And now at this point, I don't think you need to be an expert. Um, as a matter of fact, sometimes I think being an expert actually can be a disadvantage at this stage. Uh, you can't see the forest for the trees. Um, so for us, when we started with Oncomine, uh, that's the first ontology we worked on developing, uh, there were hundreds of cancer papers out there, right? If you start looking through them, you'll see, okay, all right, this breast cancer paper mentions triple negative status. Oh, this one does too. Okay, I get it, I get it, right? Um, same thing happened. Um, we had to look through a lot of supplementary materials. So Samantha uh, from AbV mentioned this yesterday. A lot of times the data that we needed was not in the, the paper, was not certainly in the abstract, and it was definitely not in GEO, right? They did the bare minimum to get the data set into GEO so they could get published. But it was there in the supplementary materials. It was also there if you asked. Sometimes we had to ask, and we would just email them and say, hey, I read your methods section. I know that's crazy. Not a lot of people do, but we do. And we saw that you collected this data. Can we have it? Um, but once we started looking, we started to see the patterns, right? In kidney disease, you're always going to see GFR. That's glomerular fil filtration rate. It's pretty much the, the measure of how your kidneys are doing. We're going to have that. We've got to be able to handle it. But just start paying attention to what the patterns are. The next step is to imitate. Um, be inspired by other composers. Thank you for the music. <laughs> um, so the, there's a lot of things out there, right? We're, we've heard SNOMED. We've heard uh, WHODRUG. We've heard MEDRA. We've heard CDIS. We've, he we've heard a lot of acronyms, right? Those people probably know what they're doing, um, but they might just not be perfect for what you need done. But that doesn't mean there's nothing you can get from them, right? So be inspired by their works and see what you can take from it. It might not be everything. It probably won't be everything. But everyone will be better for you trying to get something out there that's close and that mimics it as much as possible, and we can deal with the after effects later. All right, step three, and this is to me, maybe you should have been step one because it's the most important, but is understand your listeners. <laughs> so you need to think through what questions your users are going to ask of this data. So for us, when we were working with Transmart, we said, okay, uh, are you, we have longitudinal data, and, and we're fortunate enough to have a visit schedule. So we have our data organized by the baseline visit, the biopsy visit, right, you know, all these different follow-ups. But one of the questions we had to ask was, are people going to be looking at this data visit by visit or across visits? So which way do we, should we organize it? And we made a decision based on what was going to work for our nephrology data, 
might not be the right way to organize it for cardiovascular disease, but it was the right way for us. Um, so you really need to take a step back and think about who your users are and how they're going to use it. So another example is, I said earlier, most of our users of the um, Transmart instances are clinicians. So a lot of times they're already been pre-programmed to think compartmentally, uh, vital signs, uh, demographics, uh, you know, lab values, uh, concomitant medications, right? They've got a couple things, uh, boxes they already have in their brain. So we use those to our advantage. Um, but it's most important that just you take the time to get to know who your users are and learn from them so that you can understand how best to serve them. Because at the end of the day, this is, yes, it's gonna serve you, but you want it to serve more than you. So you gotta make sure that it serves lots of people. Maybe you're not going to be able to serve everyone, but you want to at least understand who they are so you can make a good college try. All right, what's the next step here? Really fancy, put pen to paper, okay? So at this point, you've got a lot of information, you're seeing some trends. Uh, you, what you might want to do is go take that to an expert and say, okay, I need you to help me. I need you to organize and give me, uh, you know, maybe a little tree of all the different aspects of renal disease. <clears throat> if you do that, you will not get a good answer. You will probably get, it's impossible. As a matter of fact, for the Neptune data set, one of the co goals they're doing is reclassifying renal disease. At the same time, I'm asking them to classify it because they're asking me to classify it but they're trying to change the, the, the words underneath me, right? However, when we went to those same people and said, hey, here's, here's something, uh, I don't know, you know, it's a straw man, what do you think? You know what we got? We got, well, that's pretty good. I just maybe move that one right over there and then that's good. It's crazy, but it's true. If you just put something out there as a straw man, you're probably gonna be about 80% there. And, and that, as I said earlier, right, perfect is the enemy of done. 80% is pretty darn good. I mean, I, I'm going to shoot for 95. But to start with 80% is going to really be freeing for the people that you need input from, which is a great segue to my next step, which is to rehearse the piece, right? So put that in front of people and get their input. You're not, you can't do it alone. You might be a genius. I know you're a genius. If you're at this meeting, you're probably really dang smart. But everyone will be smarter if you get together on stuff like this, right? So if you get it 80% there and then put it in front of people, then you don't have what's called bike shedding. So bike shedding <clears throat> is a concept I'm not sure if people are familiar with. I th uh, I'm probably going to screw up the story, but I think it was a bunch of engineers that were supposed to be talking about a nuclear power plant and how to fix it. And instead, they had about an hour and a half meeting about what color to paint the bike shed because it was something they could get their hands on right then because nobody had really done the pre-work on the actual problem. And they literally did have an hour and a half meeting on the color of the shed. I don't know what color it was. It probably wasn't that good. But if you put something in front of them to work with, then that meeting's going to be a lot more productive, right? So once you get a straw man out there, you know it's going to be wrong. But then you can have those people, the users and the clinicians and the experts, actually spend their time arguing about the hard stuff instead of do we put you know, demographics under this place or out in front. They might not even care, right? So put it, put it out in front of people and then rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. It's never going to be one and done, okay? So another thing you can try to do is just provide options with people. So I saw this yesterday. There were a couple, you know, the question was, do we put medical history first and then medications or medications and medical? I don't remember what the two folders were, but Give people options if that's a barrier for you. Um, hold sectionals is another musical term. That's just when you take one section of the ensemble and work with them on something. Maybe you just take the pathologist and sit down with them to work on that section, right? I don't know who your users are, who your experts are. But uh, hold sectionals if you need because everyone will have opinions on most things. But you might not really need more people in that conversation about the right way to model medical history, but you might really want them there about the pathology data, right? Um, so again, it's, it's simple stuff. Um, and the last one, and this is a tough one, I think this is the toughest one of all, is to leave some things on the cutting room floor, right? Uh, you need to be a little pragmatic. Now, I know that I came from, the first place I did an ontology for was this, uh, for Oncomine, right, which was a business, Compendia Bioscience, which was trying to make money. <laughs> so there was a point when I really wanted us to go a little farther with the ontology. And, and the CEO said, it's not worth it. 
It's not worth it. I, kn I know what you're trying to do, and it would be beautiful. I'm sure it would be lovely. But it's not going to get us any farther. Pause and do something else. And I didn't want to hear that. I really didn't. Um, but it was the right answer for us at the time. And you know what? We put a product out there in front of people. Nobody complained about the thing I was worried about them complaining about. Now, they did complain about other things. And that was good because then I could actually spend time working on that instead of getting into this quagmire that I was in. Um, so sometimes you have to be a little pragmatic. As I said, perfect is the enemy of done. And uh, at this point where we are, I think now, everyone really wants something. And then we start talking about it and we get stuck because, well, I think it should be in the database layer and I think it should be this. And I, and I really would encourage all of us to try to just pick one <laughs> and try it out and see what happens. Um, I, I, I know it'll be discouraging for the half that didn't get what they wanted picked, but they'll probably all be in the end happy that we've got something to start off of, start, something to grow from, you know, and something to improve. So this, the ontologies will never be one and done. They'll always be growing. I mean, in the case that I said with our Neptune data, they are literally changing the disease terms as part of the study. I know I'm going to have to go back and change that. And I might have to change a lot of things because of the things they're finding. But that's always going to be the case with where we're at, at the cutting edge of research. They're always going to be finding new things, and we're going to have to be flexible about that. So you need to be pragmatic, maybe leave some things behind for a later iteration or maybe forever, um, and be flexible about what you can do knowing that we're going to change. All right, uh, I think we're getting to the end here. So, right, fugue and variations. So in music, as I said, a fugue is this composition where there's one short melody that continues to get played and then interweaved with additional people picking up that melody. I'm hoping that the formula I just gave you is the, the small melody for a fugue and that all of you can pick up some of those steps and make your own melody on top of it. And I think it will be lovely. All right. Um, and I think it's really important. Um, so we have to do that with an ontology. Uh, it's tough. It's complicated. And it's cat herding, right? It's not, it's talking to people, maybe talking to people you really disagree with or really don't understand. Um, but that's, gonna, that's the hardest part. That's always where the hardest part happens. And it's worth it, though. It's so worth it. Um, and I think all of us know that here. So uh, that's really all I'm going to say. Here's a couple picks um, from some of the people that I worked with at the Kretzler lab to make this happen. Uh, those are just a select few of the people from that giant lab of people. Uh, and some of the people from Compendia, that's a picture from a long time ago. So um, Compendia was probably double the size when I left. Um, but those are, that was the main team that worked on the ontology for that. So with that said, are there any questions for the composer? So OK, thank you. <laughs> Uh, no, sorry. Well, I guess the best I can show you is just, whoop, 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 whoop. I'm sure there's a faster way to do this. Sorry. It was probably that tree. Um, th th it's so big that it's hard. I, I only cracked open a couple nodes in a couple places so that I could get it readable yet in two places. But, you know, the thing to remember talking about who our users are is this was the way we couldn't go so far. We tried CDISC. We tried uh, HPO. Um, and those were starting to mangle the terms too far for our users to understand because they s were used to seeing this data and working with this data. So there's some things under underneath that maybe we have mapping to those places, but we decided not to show that to users because we needed to uh, work for them in this case. And the same with uh, Ankamine. Whoops, if I go back up there, um, there were a lot of other ways we could have went with this, but we found that this was the way that gave the users those analyses that we wanted to see. So again, that's all just top nodes. I didn't crack any of that open. Um, but yeah. Thank you. I actually Googled and downloaded this file from somewhere. <laughs> so if you want this file, you can find it. The Ankamine ontology? Um, or I Googled Becky. Oh. Well, shucks. Hope you saw some good cat videos, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just a side note. Have you thought about motivational talks? I'm really psyched up. You're really good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I understand that you have looked at all of the ontologies that are available, and none of them worked for your particular project, and that's why you had to develop your own. Mm -hmm. So, but you've used some of them at your base. So, what did you use at the 
starting point? Right. So, well, that's a great question. So one, as I said in step two, I think, be inspired by. So right, what we really use as a starting point was the patterns that we started seeing coming out of the data. So uh, when we were developing the cancer ontology, we looked at, we tried to break it out by, uh, at the time, and this is still kind of the time, uh, by tissue type, right? Breast cancer data sets. Let's look at those together, lung cancer data sets. Remember, this was eight years ago. So this was before we were starting to make all these connections that it's just the underlying mutations and not necessarily the tissue that's the big deal. Um, but so we used a lot, in, in that case, we used a lot of just let's look at what other, all these supplementary tables are showing us and look for common threads. Um, but then we also used a lot of, you know, uh, the NCI thesaurus for uh, the uh, Oncomine ontology. It's right, so for the terminology as well as the organization, but we found that was much too thick for what we were trying to accomplish. So it was, that was another another in source of inspiration for us. Okay, and another question. These ontologies, do you have them on Bioportal? No. <laughs> How can we get um, some of the master tree to share with the community? What do you want? I'm sorry, um, I missed it. Maybe if you go to the uh, screenshot that you have for the trees, this mm -hmm. might be some standard or you know the organization that uh, the organization might want to follow right so i think we're going to try to make a collection of this okay yeah we're happy to share right yeah <laughs> so thank you very much uh, great talk and uh, i would like to get back to a point that you made at the start of your presentation that this is a personal uh, thing problem or a social i uh, think and um uh, so it, it is about um, complying with with standards and and the only type of compliance I believe in is compliance by design <laughs> and um, uh, and I think we, we encounter that um, on in many other uh, uh, areas of society apart from uh, bi biomedical research <laughs> and I think in in IT um, Microsoft Office is a great example how we all got got addicted to a couple of standards that we didn't bother about uh, whether they were the best, uh, except for the ones who came from Word Perfect, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and and that opportunity, I think, is also against the background of why we're here uh, for the transplant meeting. Something that perhaps we could utilize much more than we have uh, done so far. So, actually, um, and we have now had a number of of presentations where we actually got excited about each other's trees, and if we could kind of prepackage those in in uh, in easy starting packages for Transmart. I think that could be a huge step forward mm -hmm. because now if people start with a Transmart, uh, yeah, well they have to start with an empty box and okay, then they give up after two minutes. Right, I completely agree, and that's kind of my point of getting that eighty percent out there and you know, perfect is the enemy of done. If we get something, I mean, everyone hates Excel, but we all probably use Excel, don't we? Right? And it's the same thing that uh, it, sometimes at least there is something and that's better than, than nothing. And so I think it's a great idea to just put a couple sample trees out there and let people pick what works for them and hope that they extend it to make it better. And then they can turn that back into the community as well. I, I haven't, uh, but uh, if that's the best way to do it, let's do it. So, yeah. Everybody does it. Everybody does it. Okay. Well, in that case, yeah. That's, that's how many lemmings fell, I think. No. Absolutely. One more thing. Uh, Francis Collins said uh, you can't herd the cats, but you can move their food. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to work that into the next talk. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>